Hello, everyone. Welcome to the J3U Podcast. I'm your host, John Jewett. With me is Luke Miller. And today we are jumping into PCT and bodybuilding. And this all kind of spurs off from just getting several different client inquiries and questions regarding thoughts on using HCG, because we see these deployed frequently in hormone replacement clinics. It's just like kind of a standard script that you'll see, testosterone therapy, HCG therapy, and usually there's something like a nastrozole or an AI that goes along along with it. And so questions come out, I was like, well, how come in certain PED models, you're not seeing always HCG alongside or an AI present, or that even gets into the conversation of these compounds like HCG, serums, AIs being used in PCT? And should you be even doing PCT and how they really apply into our bodybuilding journey? So that's uh, what we're going to dive into today and try to answer some of these questions. So um, I think we could probably start this off from where we're really seeing it come from and where it in question of deploying the drugs from like a HRT perspective. Yeah. So we have to understand a lot of times, and this goes for a lot of HRT clinics, right? It's they're dealing with 99% gin pop people. The goal set of these people are literally just to feel good, look good, and just kind of go about their normal day with the expectations of having fertility reproduction, re- reproductive capacity um, within their day-to-day life, right? And it's kind of missing the whole goal set of like none of these people actually have bodybuilding related competitive goals and and you see this come, crop up with issues across multiple different hrt uh protocols like for example like pellet therapy like very common in in gin pop populations where for us like we would argue that it's not going to be beneficial any way shape or form because we're not able to titrate up and down dosing so a lot of this starts to kind of come in when people are getting scripts for their hormone replacement therapy, baseline dosing, whatever you want to refer to it as. And then these doctors are writing these prescriptions for this just under the guise of this is what they deal with on the day to day. And a lot of times it kind of takes, requires us to take a step back and ask the question and maybe come in with the dialogue to the doctor as well of like, why are we here? And is fertility specific goals conducive to competitive bodybuilding goals? And I think a lot of that's going to kind of answer like what we should do and why we shouldn't do it um, and, and why possibly we, we don't think that this is going to be a, an integral portion of our bodybuilding journey versus possibly the gin pop population. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I like to think positive, all the clinics out there, but I realize <laughs> that it's, it's a business as well. Yeah. And if you have someone that you can put on six different things, that is more that from a, a selling point, because you're in the business of selling a service or yeah. I want to say selling drugs, but you kind of are, right? <laughs> you, kind of are. <laughs> you, drug, you drug dealers, <laughs> um, but it, it, it's it, it, all these drugs, everything should be still on a needs basis. So there should never be a a yeah. stamp, a copy paste of like, this is what we just put everyone on. And in fact, that's what is what we see. So, you know, a few things that are getting in place that we see you throughout bodybuilding, um, you know, HCG, what's the idea even behind it? And the idea is to maintain some level of intra uh, testis, um, testosterone production. And that in turn can increase spermatogenesis and actually maintain some level of spermatogenesis while you're on this TRT therapy. And while that could be very well and important for someone that has fertility in mind, a lot of these people that are going under TRT therapy are mid late thirties and beyond really. And if you're 40 plus and have, have kids and you're like, Hey, I don't need, I don't want any children. Um, maybe this maintaining spermatogenesis is not even an important aspect for you. So that's a, a question to bring up. And then the other things that we see in play are usually like in a nastrozole for already managing estrogen when you don't even know the person's individual response. And we've had other podcasts talking about the benefits of estrogen and keeping that intact. So in my opinion, like TRT therapy, and even for a bodybuilding receptive, we just, I really don't, 
it's I haven't used an AI in a very long time. Um, there, there's been some very acute issues that have popped up, but for the most part, no. And, and so for TRT, you can completely manage estrogen through just the amount of testosterone using. I think, yeah, I've even seen like problematically, someone asked me like, is there any downsides to using HCG? And I've seen higher amounts of aromatization um, of testosterone using HCG and, and requiring more estrogen management. So there, there is a, an aspect that could be negative of just, it's not all positives with, with using uh, just HCG along the way. So, I mean, that's, that's where like, I think these things are getting deployed from the HRT clinics. I think a lot of it is just like, this is just a standard protocol and you can put people on more things, but it still needs to be like, do they need it? And there's a way that we maybe don't require those things by using other methods. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where you start to see that stamp of everybody gets this is like, I I've gotten into it with, with a provider before about uh, a client that didn't want the HCG portion of it, but the, the doctor was adamant about prescribing an astrazole alongside the test, but the doctor hadn't been managing his HRT. He was transferring from doing it himself with me to having a script so that he could travel with it. And you see this like, lack of specificity in deployment because they're just consistently deploying it, seeing possibly some of that increased aromatization with the HCG and or other fertility drugs that are in play. And then it's just this stamp of approval that's not deployed on a needs basis, right? And so this is where, you know, we kind of got to bring it into competitive bodybuilding at some point of a lot of us who do travel quite frequently, it is going to be necessary to get prescriptions and have those conversations with doctors about what you're going to need from a baseline basis um, and, and where do we kind of map out those baseline periods within a year and what that looks like. And to me, when we start to talk about competitive bodybuilding versus fertility, you can't prioritize both. And we had talked about this off camera a little bit about how if the goal is fertility in the sense that we want to try to keep that intact as much as possible in order to do that, the baseline doses that you have at your TRT or whatever, the, the in-between health phases is going to be so low to require the capacity to be able to restore spermatogenesis. And then the duration of time that it takes as well, it's typically three to four months because the life cycle of an actual sperm is about 90 days. So you're looking at extending these health phases longer than that restoration period because you don't want to just get it back and then shut it back down. So then you're looking seven, eight, nine months down the line when you could have been making progress because you've already cleared a lot of the health implications of pulling back down to baseline months ago. And so this is where the conversations like this is another reason from maximizing a progress perspective. This doesn't really fit into the competitive goals of, of bodybuilding. Yeah, that with with that mindset if, you, if that's someone that's already going into it with that mindset because you'd have to say like all right fertility is really important to me so i'm going to do this cycle and i'm going to be coming off and i'm going to run this pct like if you already have that in your mind i think my first thing would be go ahead and go get your sperm frozen um because yeah. even after doing this even a, a couple runs like it, it, it could be a potential that you don't return um, spermatogenesis very quickly, or you could be, become infertile. Um, I think the incidence of actual having like infertility, it, 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 people get restored pretty well. I actually pulled, um, there's a good fertility paper with steroid usage. And I mean, I'll read it like directly from this paper. It was like, uh, sp while sp spontaneous recovery of spermatogenesis can occur, with the cessation of TRT or AAS use alone can take several months to years. Um, they're stating like from this other paper, looking at steroid users, the median times for spermatogenesis to recover to thresholds of like 20 to 3 million per mil were um, somewhere between like three to two and a half months uh, re respectively. And 67% of men recovered to sperm concentrations of 20 million per mil within six months. Um, but some men took up to two years. So, you know, with that in mind, like it, it's high, a lot, a large percentage of people that use steroids are able to recover fully. 
and to good levels. However, the timeline can be an issue for many people, like six months to two years, a lot of guys want to stop using and, and get someone pregnant within the first month to say like, hey, this just, it could happen. It just might take more time. And that's going to be along with how long to use for as, as well. Uh, but I think those are important things to consider. Like if this is an important thing to go into, like what can you do fertility right away? And one would be, yeah, free, freezing your sperm if you know you want to have children later on. And it's not expensive. Like it's literally, I think, $60 a month to freeze your sperm and hold it at a sperm bank. Because it was something that, you know, if we didn't have many embryos happen through our IVF process, we were going to go ahead and do and have that frozen anyways. And it's, it's super cheap. Like that's less than most people's gym memberships. So it's like, if it is that important, it might be something just on the forefront that you get taken care of. Um, because I can, I can tell you just like my bodybuilding process with going through the fertility treatments, like we've both talked about this, like separate, like there was probably some tissue lost during that phase because of how low I had to pull down a couple other life variables and factors, but it's, it is, something that may not be the best for the pursuit of competitive bodybuilding. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I didn't know it was like 60 a month. Super I, cheap. Yeah. I, oh, I guess the, depending on your bank account, right? <laughs> yeah. People might be like, man, screw that. But if you say <laughs> screw that, you probably realize like, Hey, that's not that important to you. If it's that important to you, 60 bucks a month, you'd probably make room for it. I yeah. mean, it might actually like, I don't know, maybe your monthly HCG bill would be 60 bucks a month versus you have some like good solid of like sperm, sperm freezing. Like that's probably more of a guarantee than your, your H or HCG protocol. Um, so with, with that being said, um, you get questions around like using HCG while on cycle then. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that is coming down to like, not understanding how shutdown like occurs and understanding that in the presence of super physiological, super physiological compounds, you're, you're going to be sending signals both directions and nine times out of 10, the signaling from the shutdown from the super physiological dosing is going to be much stronger than anything that an HCG or some combination of HCG and Clomid or HCG and HMG is going to be able to keep, right? Because we're constantly sending that that feedback through the loop that, hey, we have too much, and this is just going to lower the likelihood of fertility reproductive capacity. Yeah, I've seen in like TRT dosing, some like concomitant HCG usage, ability mm -hmm. to maintain some level of spermatogenesis. I don't see as much like with and how are you going to even monitor that? Like with, they're actually, they're actually, well, I'll take that back. There was a study with like, and it was observational because you can't give these guys like, Hey, take a bunch of steroids and HCG <laughs> uh, that no one's going to approve that. Right. But um, they, they monitor these guys and, they, and some were using like HCG and high dose anabolics at the same time. And it did maintain levels, some level degree of spermatogenesis. However, the interesting thing is that there was a higher level of, um, abnormal sperm that was maintained too have you read or heard anything like this was something that we were dealing with because kind of going into ivf one of the problems that we were kind of running into was the viable sperm count right so the count was increasing however the amount of the actual viable wasn't as high of a percentage of the total count that it should be which is where we kind of made the decision to jump into ivf sooner than most people would right because it's one of those things where when you go through the IVF process, they are selecting the highest quality sperm to go into the fertility process, which for me was, for lack of a better term, few and far between. And so it just heightened our uh, capacity to be able to have a child that didn't have issues, right? Like, not that, that anything is bad with like birth defects or anything, but if you can limit that, it's going to be desirable, right? So um, that's kind of the direction that we headed because of that. And so this is where it's like, look, like, you know, plan for a longer fertility process, but I don't think within the confines of that super physiological phase, it's going to be warranted for what you just cited there, right? Like the, the percentage of viable. Yeah. Well, it seems like with protocols that you can put in place, if you're like, okay, I'm ready to have children now, um, 
you know, get your sperm tested to even know where you're currently at. And then mm. you could put things in place to help aid that process at that time. But it looks like if you're headed that direction, you're probably headed that direction, whether you have HCG within these years of usage or not, it, it, hard to say if it's really going to be impactful. Um, now the, the risk, say the risk of using some level amount, low level amount of HCG during that period, ah, maybe that is relatively low. And if that increases your odds slightly, understandably so, but that's not something that I'm going to be doing for every single person that we're putting PED protocols in, into place. Um, because again, it's based off the needs of the individual, the risk we're willing to accept and what they have, have goal wise, but I would do that in place. But I think with bodybuilding still as like someone coming to me with bodybuilding as a primary goal to take the most leaps and progress, it would still to not be doing some type of like intermediate PCT protocol, as I, I do think we do end up to the same outcome endpoints, whether we're, we're doing that or not. But at the same time, I think it's I was telling you off camera, you're kind of doing a half-ass job of both like half-ass job of fertility and a half-ass job of bodybuilding so um you kind of yeah. need to go all in like hey if you want to be if you want to be fertile like yeah bodybuilding like enhanced bodybuilding is probably not the best route for you um, <laughs> if you want to be a great bodybuilder uh then go all in on that and you might be sacrificing your fertility later on but that is just the, the realism i know nowadays we are looking for safer use models to where, oh, I can take steroids and not have any steroid side effects. And that would be in fact, just lying to yourself. And um, that just doesn't exist. So these, these are the real risk of doing this. And you have to just realize that. And I think your point of like, it only takes one to lower the possibility of fertility, like sure. one cycle is like, man, you, if, if this is something that you're thinking about, it, it is something that you really probably should take a little bit longer to consider before you start that journey of enhanced bodybuilding, right? Because this is something that if I ever get like a, a natural client that's transferring over, I'll sit down and have a talk with them. Like, look, like here's the benefits, here's the risks, because there are always risk, no matter the model, if it's low, medium, or high risk model. Obviously, a first time user is going to be in the low risk, but the fertility one is one that I always bring up on the forefront because it's like, I don't know what your resiliency is. We all have different genetic capacities for resiliency in our systems. There's a possibility that after one cycle that you are going to have fertility issues and that might be something that you need to accept. And then kind of off the back of that, once you're in enhanced bodybuilding for a period of time, one of the things to consider is what does baseline dosage look like for these individuals? And baseline dosages for people in that medium to high risk are much higher than clinical HRT. So we're probably riding these people, you know, above reference range to some extent um, on, on lab work, right? If we're looking at that is necessary for that individual to retain tissue and not take steps backwards in their bodybuilding process, you would not be doing yourself a service, again, half-assing both by just doing HCG and Clomid at that baseline dosage, right? Because again, you're still technically super physiological. While that may be the baseline dose that you need in order to retain tissue, it's still not a baseline clinical HRT dose, which was something that you know I experienced with the, the fertility process was a big one was typically, you know, you and I, my baseline's around 300, like somewhere in that 250 to 300. And I was asked to pull all the way back to about 150 by the fertility specialist. And I fucking felt it. And it was a big difference, right? But from a tissue retention standpoint, it also made it a lot harder for me to retain the tissue that I had built in that all season phase. So again, it's, it's going to make you kind of half foot in each one where you're not doing either one to the best of your capacity. Yeah, because you probably would have maybe got a more a bigger response. You pull all the way off TRT testosterone completely, right? And you're like, no way, I'm not doing that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not because that's how you would fully get some quicker restoration of FSH, LH on your own, and and like where Clomid would probably really shine. Um, idea behind Clomid is like like estrogen is going to be you'll have low test 
and have still some estrogen present. Estrogen still going to be a um, you know negative feedback for LH secretion. So that's the idea of using clomid is like lowering estrogen. So the pituitary puts out more luteinizing hormone, makes you produce testosterone to in turn raise estrogen. So that's that's how that will works in turn. But if you're still taking a TRT dosage and you're still aromatizing, having a lot of estrogen, you're kind of you're kind of like fighting against what the <laughs> fertility drugs are trying to do. But I get it because we want to have like, like you said, one foot in the door, one foot out. <laughs> um, so uh, that, uh, you know, that that's, I think another thing with this too is um, it, we talk about fertility, but also some people bring up um, testosterone, mm. uh, bringing their natural levels back because maybe they don't want to be on TRT forever. I mean, you know, that's don't do bodybuilding. Then. Yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for one, just the aging male, you're kind of going there anyway, and definitely yeah. with using steroids, you're probably going to go there a lot faster. And um, you know, like you said, it's it's upon the individual. Some mm -hmm. guys they restore their levels even after years of, of use. Some guys don't, and it's just after a one or two cycles, and and, and you really don't know. So if like, that's uh, an issue for you in a, an area where you're like, I'm not well, know if I'm willing to commit to that. Well, then you're, you know, that's your risk adverse level that you need to, to be aware of. But um, even for those individuals, like, Hey, I want to come off cycle just to make sure like I restore my natural test levels. I still find that being problematic because then why even do it to begin with? But also we go back to the point of like realizing out your full bodybuilding goals and in turn, where you're just trying to maintain natural testosterone function. I still hold strongly like we should still use testosterone as a starting point in males yes, for all the reasons that you give physiological estrogen and DHT present. And um, then even, you know, the other options of like, well, I just want to start with an oral cycle because it's shorter duration. And um, I don't know if I want to go fully in with this, but still like that thought process that leads to the same outcomes of you're still going to get shut down, but also you're using much harsher compounds for your health. And you're also going into areas where you're, while you're on cycle without physiological estrogen, then to a post cycle phase where you also don't have physiological estrogen in your hypogonadal. So it's actually would probably be more deleterious to your health running it that way versus using some degree of just testosterone for a longer duration. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think this is kind of circling back a little bit, but um, when we look at the introduction of steroids from an initial conversation from a coaching perspective, I think one of those points that I was talking like you go over the risks or the bullet points or the expectations is that if you're going to pursue bodybuilding full on and you've made that decision to go into enhanced bodybuilding in order to do that, you know, having an understanding that doing that at its highest level does not include pulling back to a natural testosterone level yeah. because of everything that we had mentioned before. And I think that that is a misnomer because you get, you know, people or pros that are like, I'm off of everything to clean out for X amount of time or X amount of weeks or whatever. And it's like, yeah, sure. Maybe you are, but there's probably a lot of other cofactors that they're not considering and they're uh, only doing it for the duration of the time that the esters are clearing anyway. So they're never really fully off in the first place. And it's like that kind of cycle that's happening. Right. So um, just know going in that there's going to be this fluctuation from like escalating into peak peak to baseline and then back again, right? And that there's really never going to be a time of returning to natural testosterone production. Yeah. Whenever I see someone that's like, I, they come off for the month, like usually it's after a show. For I feel like all the people that I ever see say that are the complete genetic freaks. Um, and those are the ones that I wouldn't want to be following what they do anyway, because <laughs> it, it, it's just not even going to work for you. They do a lot of other stuff that wouldn't make sense either um with their training and their nutrition and uh, just those are the worst people to follow for what they're doing gear wise because it just has zero application to you because their genetics just have that much leverage on their their results so but like like you said even if they're off for a month like and they're coming off of like a three gram per week 
you know, pre-contest <laughs> load, like pff, you're never off. You're still on. <laughs> you're probably still super physiological that month later. Right. Um, and that gets, I, you know, that's another point on even doing a PCT. And, yeah, and you mentioned it earlier, how long these esters clear. So, you, you know, people don't factor that in, which uh, I, I think Dr. Dean, it's the first that I was hearing about like when timelines were really starting your PCT and it should be like four to five half-lives of an ester, which, you know, say your average half-life for like a sipionate is like seven days. You're looking at like 30 days before you even get down to a baseline where you could recover. And then that would be like pulling those labs, seeing if it's, if it's even, maybe you already recovered or just giving that some time on its own. Uh, Cause there was even the, the Harlem study. It was an observational study in 2021, recent one, um, looking at steroid users, whether they use PCT or not. And there was an insignificant difference in the testosterone level recovery time, whether they use these, like it was Clomid or Novidex or no PCT at all. So really sometimes this stuff just comes down to time for restoring yeah. natural levels. But again, that time duration, it's, it can be a chunk of time. Like it, like those in that study, it was like three months to restore, but then you don't want to just jump right back on cycle because you're just also going to continually cause oxidation to the testes and maybe not ever be truly able to come back up. So, you know, that's gets to the point of like, do you really want to be doing PCT at all? I would lean heavily towards not doing it. And I, I would mention in that, in that study too, like the three month time that these guys recovered, they checked them a year later, later and their test levels were about the same, which when I say about the same, they were like in the four hundreds, which uh, is not great. So <laughs> what I'm saying is like for, for once you start diving in and dabbling, like it's, it's likely you're not going to get those test levels back up to the six, 700 that you saw, like maybe in your early twenties, like it's just, um, not, not going to be there. So. Yeah. 100%. I think a question that coincides with this and I don't know how deep you want to get into this question is how do I talk to my doctor about this? Like, how do I bring this to my clinician and to bring this up? Um, I, what, the way I go about it is I typically just type an email or, some type of verbal like hey this is kind of the logic like in a voice note of like why we would be doing this talk to them present it to them and see what they say did you do that with your doctor oh yeah i, I get into arguments with mine it's not okay <laughs> so yeah, all right so they, they yeah. have an understanding yeah they they have an understanding where it's kind of like they know that the the level of like the way that I go about it and they, they have like on the same page, like it's, it's fine. It's not an issue. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are very hesitant to say what they do in general to their doctors. Cause they're worried about, Oh, is this going to go on my medical record? And um, what about my life insurance? I don't want anyone to find out about this. So I yeah. mean, yeah, maybe it does start as like just a verbal conversation. Um, but also, you know, the bodybuilding community, it's, it, it is small, but also we're pretty connected everywhere. So I, I would ask your fellow bodybuilders, physique competitors around like, Hey, what positions are you going to, who's, you know, more open to having conversations versus just shutting you down. And I feel like you can find a network within that, that people are just willing to just at least hear you out somewhat. And, and gosh, even within doctors, like it should be that way anyway. So yeah. even if there wasn't a doctor that was, that, you know, wasn't open to talking about what I do bodybuilding wise, they're probably not the best doctor anyway, because they're not open to discussing how you feel and what your goals are as an individual. So um, yeah, I would ask around before just trying to schedule an appointment and go, Hey, doctor, you know, you, you, you cool with me taking some steroids and treating me like <laughs> that might be a little abrupt and set them back a little bit. So um, I would, uh, yeah, yeah. Try to try to ask around a little bit first. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that'll help. Is there anything else within the confines of using these that you think needs to be addressed as far as whether or not it's anything we should be considering in, in our pursuit of physique development? I mean, as far as like for, for, for within males, like aromatase inhibitors and serms, I mean, if, if there's an, a, an acute deployment of like a serum if some type of gyno was coming up, but then we adjust stack design, get that under control, then remove it. 
but if you're also following like the models that Luke and I are doing where we just slowly bring up testosterone, like we understand what that point is before it ever even gets there. Um, even where I've come in situations where some guys are like, Hey, I feel like I'm having some sensitivity. It's so mild because we're not taking these drastic jumps in testosterone, like going from 200 megs to thousand megs in a week to where it's an easy stack design adjustment. And I'm, I don't need to go there. So even within like that deployment of an AI or CERM, I don't, I don't have the usage for then HCG potentially, it just has to be weighed on the individual needs for that person and their, and their importance for fertility. And if it, you know, fertility is an important aspect, then um, you could do some low dosing. And I feel like relatively, you know, if you want to discuss with fertility specialists, like that risk might be relatively low. So, I mean, I feel like that kind of sums it up, but we're, you know, if you fully want to see how bodybuilding, it's making a big commitment to bodybuilding with the realization that you might not restore testosterone function or fertility, but there are options out there. Um, there's guys that have been doing this for years that still have, have children. So um, it's promising, but again, there's risk. Yep. 100%. And I think that kind of leaves it where it's like, you know, the decision is, is, is yours to make ultimately. Right. But if we look at the confines of optimal physique development, you know, there's, there's special cases, but most of the time not going to fit within the, within the goal set. Yeah. I mean, if, if physique is your number one goal, it's not aiding anything. No. Aid, absolutely not. Especially downtime phases. I mean, they they happen for other reasons, but for reasons of restoring testosterone and fertility, I, I think that's a terrible reason um, to be pulling back. It should be based on other, other variables. So for bodybuilding, goals i think it's very counterproductive um yeah. in doing so yep 100 percent. well i think that was a fairly good synopsis of the possibilities that you could run to in regards to this um i think kind of like we said earlier like just search around there's doctors who are willing to work with competitors who may even be competitors themselves and understand it like I've had people, especially like up in the Washington area with Selena, who we had on that she works great with every one of my competitors up there as far as helping them manage their health. So yeah, that's another thing too, is, is telemedicine, right? We, with, since like COVID, like the, the spread of virtual medicine and what you can do through over, even over state lines, there's, you know, certain states have certain limitations, but regardless, um, you know, you, you can get good care. There's even some Physicians like, hey, if you may, if you really need a certain physician, travel once to see him. Then after that, like you've had a face-to-face -face visit and you could just do telemedicine from there. But yeah, that's that's a point. Is like you don't you're not restricted just to your own city now for care. Yep, 100 percent Well, John, I think that was a, a really good episode. I think that really answers a lot of the questions that I get on a week to week basis because it's a consistent one in my day to day for sure. Cool. We will wrap it up there, everybody. Appreciate you tuning in and we will talk to you next time.